Hi, Michaela. Hello. So this is a new style of episode for the Michaela Bone podcast, in which we'll be having kind of a conversation on various different themes. I think it's likely I'll serve uh, primarily or mainly as the interrogator, the inquisitor, and asking you questions and posing uh, conundrums to you and see what comes out of that. We'll use, I think, that discussion structure uh, quite a lot. But it's going to be, I think, very interesting indeed. And there's lots of different themes we're going to cover. We, you know, we deal, of course, with the theme of relationships, but also I think we'll go further afield to themes of embodiment, themes of resilience, uh, themes of high performance, and all the sorts of things that uh, you're known for and that we, the sort of things that we work together on. Uh, I think that would be very interesting indeed. So do you have any, any thoughts or anything you want to say about this new series, I suppose, this new season before we begin? <laughs> no, I think it's going to be really uh, fun and interesting because, of course, on one end, uh, we work together and we have uh, common terrains we cover, but then there we have individual uh, you know, expertise and insights and also um, your style of asking questions and the way we, uh, you know, discuss things can be quite interesting and quite diverse. So I'm really looking forward to diving into this and kind of developing this and um, also kind of uh, extracting certain themes and, and kind of deepen into some of those as we go along with this new format. Yeah, so it's definitely not a lecture format. It's a discussion format with, I expect, some vigorous disagreement at times, I would anticipate. Or in, maybe it'll be unlike any conversation we've ever had and we'll be completely agreeing yeah. on everything. But I think <laughs> it's <laughs> likely there'll be some disagreement. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, let's get started. Okay. <laughs> Michaela, you've been working in the field of relationships as a relationship counselor and expert for quite some time. Now, you said something like 30,000 plus counseling hours. And how many years have you been doing this? I think I started in the States in 98. And so you can do the math on that. It's, it's been a little while. Yeah, and you do, of course, I think people know you for several things. Your author, embodiment, uh, teaching with your nonlinear movement method and so on. But Perhaps the thing you're most known for is your relationship expertise. I'm curious in all that time. So that's 98. So that would be 23 years, 23 years or so. Of course, when people come to a relationship counselor, they often have problems, problems of some sort in their relationships or problems, I guess, finding one or maintaining one or whatever. And I'm curious what, if you think back to the beginning of, the sorts of problems you were encountering or people were reporting to you in 1998 compared to at the time of recording 2021, uh, what has changed and what has remained the same? I'm curious if there are issues that were once prominent back in the late 90s, early 2000s that have died out now or greatly reduced, or if there are new issues that you didn't see then, but you see now, 20 years later, and what issues have you noticed that are consistent throughout your career? That's a pretty intense question. So, and a pretty good question. So, um, well, I would say that as far as what people want out of relationship and the problems that come into a relationship once you have one have pretty much stayed consistent. However, how that plays out has changed substantially. And I also think culturally, um, certain awareness and, and certain ways that um, people uh, react in relationship has changed substantially. I want to say, though, that um, also, because I think that's important for what we're going to talk about, um, is that I didn't only see couples. I used to also see people individually, but within the general field of relationship, intimacy, sexuality, performance, as it kind of pertained to um, people being sidetracked by their, con by their relationships or sidetracked by their issues and not being able to perform. So, so it's been this kind of very interesting view into um, why do people have relationships? Why don't they? What happens if their relationship status isn't for them settled? And 
Um, I think uh, one of the greatest changes I've seen, and then we'll talk about what stayed the same, but one of the greatest changes I've seen is I think more people have become aware and understand that the traditional relationship model isn't the only one and also that it, that's not the one that's worked for many, many people over many, many years, right? And so I think where we are now as far as looking at relationships is that societally as well as with what's available and information, there's a little bit more openness towards considering that the picket fence, uh, station wagon, 1.5 kids uh, situation isn't the only situation and that um, people's lifestyles and who they are and how they want to express themselves in the world um, doesn't always go with that particular model. And um, I think that's one of the big things uh, that at least can be considered nowadays, that not everybody wants to be in that set of relationship, uh, you know, kind of considerations or wants to have children. And that in 98 wasn't really the case. People have the same issues. They were cheating and lying and having multiple partners and, um, you know, doubting their relationship and not knowing if they wanted children or wanted children and if they wanted children with the person they were with. And all of that, that happened back then as well. But um, the options are much uh, bigger. And I think the other thing that's, of course, substantially changed is um, social media, our access to dating apps, you know, Tinder, things like that. Um, the availability, the, the wide availability of porn from a very young age on, of course, had that, that wasn't as available back then, right? And uh, being able to date people can date now or also seeing things on social media uh, as people see now and the availability via text and all of that, that wasn't there back then. So it uh, it had a different pace of exploration than it has now. And it certainly, I think, was not um, as pressured and overwhelming back then as it is now. But the, um, the general ideas of, or the general problems people have, have stayed the same. Are they with the, with the right person? Can they find the right person? Should they have children? Should they not have children? Um, uh, issues with communication. And then of course the big issue, which is one of the things that I kind of had to somewhat specialize in because it was such a big issue was the lack of spark um, after a while, the lack of um, sexual compatibility, what that meant, ensuing um, trust uh, issues, not only just uh, cheating, but also with porn, with, um, you know, kind of um, online romances of some odd kinds that, that had nothing to do with the existing relationship. All of those things are still there and always have been there. Yeah, that's very interesting. You said that one of the main changes that you've noticed is that other forms of relationship are uh, more commonly considered, or there's a greater awareness with, around them. I'm curious what those forms are, what problems they solve that were occurring in 1998, and if they come with their own set of problems. You mentioned the internet, for example, and the internet, of course, has many great benefits. It also has some drawbacks in certain aspects. I wonder if that's true with these uh, alternate relationship forms and perhaps actually you could define some of them. Yeah, I would say, well, I think in general, right, when people would come into the office, um, in my office, because at that point and for many years thereafter, 98 onwards, but for many, many years thereafter, I would spend five days a week, nine hours a day in sessions, right? So I do nine sessions a day, five days a week, probably about 50, 49 to 50 um, weeks out of the year. And I did that till the, you know, early 2000s, I don't know, tens, something like that. And then, you know, I transitioned more and more into teaching. So, so that was a, like a vast period of time where people would come in pretty much with the same things. And the things were um, 
should I be in a relationship? Right, so th that kind of questioning was always there, but it was back then just considered that that's what you did. You did relationship. And it was kind of unquestioningly that eventually you dated enough that you found somebody with whom you would get married and have children, right, more or less. Or if you were um, in a same-sex relationship, you would, you know, move in eventually. People were allowed to marry as well. But, of course, I lived in West Hollywood, so that was a pretty big deal uh, back then when, when people in same-sex relationships could actually get married. But before then, even, it was like, well, are we going to li live together? What does that mean? Um, you know, so there was there was a lot of consideration. Is it the things to do individually people would come in? Is it the thing to do? Um, and if they were questioning it, then um, they had to kind of reckon with what that meant, you know, what their parents thought, uh, what their partner thought when if they already had a partner. So there was that kind of general, should I uh, be in one relationship? And often people had multiple things going on. And um, if their partner knew about it, they were hoping that that would settle right, in some way. And if the partner didn't know about that, that was a whole other set of circumstances because then you had to deal with cheating or mistrust or things like that. Right? So, and then of course there were relationships I was working with where people had multiple partners, uh, which, back then happened, but wasn't really that much discussed. Nowadays, of course, particularly in California, but funny enough, I just uh, did a session with somebody in Portugal. Um, and, you know, there, there's also a whole culture now of people being uh, polyamorous or, um, you know, having open relationships of various kinds or having um, wives and mistresses or, you know, things of that nature. And not all secondary relationships are sexual always, but the uh, willingness to explore that um, maybe one person doesn't solve it all on one end is, um, I think, uh, much more prevalent these days. And then the other thing that I've seen um, greatly, um, you know, increase is, of course, second marriages where the first marriage didn't go so well because uh, the, the whole getting into the relationship, doing the thing that was expected internally as well as externally um, came also with you know, being attached to somebody that you shouldn't be attached to or choosing someone who really replicated the childhood patterns and things of that nature. And then people divorcing eventually, but uh, in their second marriage, actually not making that same mistake. And often, and I did a lot of that, um, particularly in the last five, six years of my super intensive counseling career, I worked a lot with people who had second marriages, but still wanted to maintain friendship and good relationship with their first spouse because of children and where there were blended families. So where there were two sets of kids and then there were two sets of ex-spouses and they all had to be somewhat integrated so that it was a much better um, set of circumstances for everyone involved, mainly the children, but also the adults. So I think that's, a, that's kind of a newer relationship model. Uh, that's not so much between those two people, even though that requires a lot of um, good communication and ability and maturity and ability to actually look at issues between two people when there's exes involved and the exes maybe have new partners, right? So it becomes this whole big conglomerate. And um, I've worked with uh, families where they very successfully have managed to work all of that out. And there is now a Christmas with, you know, the two new people married and their partners with their partner, their ex-partners with their partners and all the kids from all those relationships. <laughs> so that can happen. And that's, um, that's actually a, a, a relationship model all in itself because it takes quite a, a bit. And then of course, the other relationship model that I already talked about that's been um, quite 
you know, I think getting a lot of press and a lot of attention is multiple partners or primary and secondary partners where people have decided instead of the cheating and, and in the breaking of the trust that they somewhat attend to that. Even nowadays, right, the, the clients that we see uh, in a counseling situation together, uh, you and I, or separately, you know, in our individual practices, um, there is still a lot of um, how do I find a proper partner? Um, how do I keep a partner? How do I keep the relationship, um, you know, erotically alive? And when is it time to go? Right. Is it time to go? When is it time to go? These are still the same questions. And then within that, there is, of course, the whole um, what do we do when we no longer are sexually attracted to each other? What do we do when we have um, separate um, values or ideas? What do we do when we no longer feel uh, that we are aligned? You know, when is it time to go? When is it time to work it out? Um, and uh, those kind of things, they've stayed consistent throughout. Okay, a few questions come from what you said there. I'd actually like to ask you a bit about this assumption that you said has changed now, which is that people were assuming you'd date and then find a partner and would go on in some sort of monogamous way. And you said that that's changed uh, to, to an extent. And I'm curious if you why that's changed. But, uh, but perhaps before we get to that, you know, I was asking about these new forms of relationship that you're mentioning that people are engaging in. And, and I asked you what problems they solve. And you said it seems that some of the problems that they're solving or are intended to solve is this idea of wanting other partners or, or so on. Boredom, I presume that's boredom, erotic or emotional in the relationship or, or something like that. Or let me put it this way. What's the cause of the desire for other partners? And what's the cause of that? Are there other options than uh, opening the uh, relationship up to multiple partners? It's not immediately obvious to me that that format, while it may work for some, is inherently less dysfunctional than a monogamous uh, pairing, especially when children are involved. So I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think I want to also be very clear here that you asked me what are people's considerations and problems um, and what do I see between 1998 and now? So I personally don't uh, think that uh, multiple partners or open relationships are better or more advisable than monogamy, uh, you know, or things like that. I, I personally don't have um, any must do recommendation. I think um, choosing style of relationship is very, very individual and it's based on childhood patterns, previous relationships, traumas, uh, life circumstances and all of that. So I'm not uh, you know, saying be monogamous or don't be monogamous or open your relationship or close your relationship. So I just wanna say that because uh, uh, it's, it's not one or the other. So, um, but so, so there's a few things that, we, because you ask me, what do I see in, in my work and in our work, right? And so there's a few things. There is the natural um, wantingness to pair bond, right? And to find someone uh, with whom to settle down and uh, fulfill a kind of a biological as well as emotional as well as societal prerogative towards a pair coming together, uh, becoming, um, you know, a, a unit that functions well and that produces offspring and families and community and purpose, so to speak, right? I think that's a very, very natural impulse in, in both the body, biologically speaking, emotionally, and also societally. And I think a lot of people grow up uh, wanting that, seeing that, uh, not everybody sees it modeled in the way they were brought up, but some people did, I did. My parents are still married very um, successfully and happily. So I, I was modeled something and my grandparents were married till you know one of them died and so on. So there's certain things you get modeled or not modeled, but there's also modeling in movies, of course, right? And 
romance novels and whatever. So there's a, there's a very strong, this is the way it should be. And within that, this is the way it should be. There is all the things that we wish for and yearn for, as well as all the things that make sense um, in, in all different kinds of ways. So within that, some people very happily engage in that, and that works really good for them. That's their chosen model. And then within that model, there is a set of concerns and considerations, right? So um, that con set of concerns and considerations has to do at some point, like you said, with things like boredom or the spark wearing off. Um, it has to do with lack of communication skills. There might be some childhood stuff in there, like or some attachment style issues or childhood programming that makes it that we pick people who replicate the issues of our childhood. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that happen in that pair bonded situation that might require attention, right? you know, might or might not. Um, and all of those can be worked on in, in, in any of the work we do personally, as well as teaching, right? And other modalities that we don't work with. Um, but then there's some other stuff that happens. One of which is that, um, of course, that level of relationship or that, um, that engagement works best when you are not fully formed as a human, so to speak, meaning when you started young and you become the kind of person you are within the relationship. That tends to help when there's a, a, a pair bonding uh, at a time that's formative and where you get to become somebody in the world and the parent and the human within that context of relationship, that seems to be, um, you know, something that's produced quite a bit of longevity for a lot of people. Uh, but there's, there's of course issues there. One of which is um, when you when you develop while you get into the relationship, eventually you might have developed into somebody who's no longer compatible with that person. Right, that can happen, or. Um, your values change so dramatically that it no longer works, or um, you realize that you didn't take the entirety of your per personality or who you are as a person into account when you made the choice you made. And then that creates a whole set of circumstances. But another thing that happens, of course, in relationship is because relationships, uh, you know, marriage models were uh, created when people didn't live that long and also were created when there wasn't such a variety of options out there in the world. Um, the, the idea that one partner can uh, fulfill all your needs and wants is pretty crazy, right? Because no human being should have to do that. But that's still an idea and that you should only do things with your one partner and, uh, and, and all of that. And that, of course, leads to uh, intellectual uh, destimulation, so to speak, or boredom, right? It can lead to um, sexual boredom or, um, you know, lack of skills with each other and all of that. Uh, there can also be incompatibility. So um, one of the things that always has happened, as is well documented through the ages, is that people then have other partners for other Reasons, not everyone, of course, right? But one of the ways that people sometimes uh, deal with their, um, you know, dissatisfaction is they they find other outlets, and other outlets could be hobbies, right? Harmless outlets would be hobbies, or joining a club, or having friends with whom to do things where there's a little bit more intellectual stimulation, or social stimulation, or interest stimulation. Of course, people turn to porn, and you know, that's that's a common go-to as well. Uh, and some people cheat or or have kind of emotional entanglements with people um, that they might not be sexual with, you know, somebody at the office or whatever. So when when people suddenly want other input, right? Um, that could be people, things, 
stimulation, right? And and uh, you've heard me talk about this before, and I think I even, yeah, I wrote about that in the book, uh, lifestyle porn, right? Lifestyle porn being about as harmful as actual porn, meaning when you go through all the Instagram accounts that show people having the kind of life that you think you should be having, but think you don't have, you know, like that dissatisfaction, that can really creep into relationship. And so some people then say, uh, well, I don't want to um, do things behind my partner's back. I want to maintain uh, the kind of depth of relationship. So I'm going to say this doesn't work for me, just you and I. I want to see other people is typically what happens, right? That kind of stuff. So sometimes that works and sometimes that's a dysfunctional in the realm of um it makes things way more complicated. It creates um, a kind of a drama that makes the relationship interesting, but that in the long run has some pretty negative effects on the nervous system, so to speak, of either partner. And, um, you know, sometimes people can really arrange themselves in a way that they can be honest with each other and have certain things. And like I said, it doesn't have to be at the multiple sexual partners, but uh, sometimes it's perfectly okay for people to have hobbies that take them away from home or make them go travel or have other people um, that they get very, you know, into something with, and that's perfectly fine. And that works for the relationship. And sometimes, you know, somebody who goes sailing every single weekend with their friends um, is going to erode the relationship because it's too far out and they don't come back reinvigorated and uh, as an exciting human, they come back distracted and tired. Then it's not going to work, right? But it can work. And of course, for some people having multiple sexual partners and that being uh, known is a whole lifestyle, right? Um, where the, the, the engagement in that particular consideration and talking it out and dealing with it becomes part of their um, engagement with their own material, right? Now, is that healthy? That I think is an individual um you know, uh, assessment that has to be made because on one end, it could make people mature into really their both their boundary setting, their personal expression and their understanding of who they are. But on the other hand, it could obscure the real issues by constantly spinning the wheels of that, who does what with whom and that needs to be processed, right? And then some people just have an understanding they'll never talk about it and that works. And some people have an understanding never talk about it and it festers under the surface till uh, it hits some kind of a roadblock that then makes them have to really, really, you know, uh, step up and deal with things. So it's a really, really treacherous area um, and, you know, a really difficult and nuanced area of um, engagement, you know, relationally and otherwise, when you are having one main thing and then you are branching out from there sexually or non-sexually, emotionally or non-emotionally, right? So there's there's so much in there. But there has been quite a bit um, of that exploration uh, recently, particularly in the last four or five years that I've seen way, way, way more than ever before uh, with varying, um, you know, positive or negative results. Yeah, that's very interesting. Sometimes I... I have the thought that, uh, you know, some relationship difficulties can be solved by changing the structure of the relationship. But if if the source of the relationship difficulty is in oneself, then you can cycle through as many different uh, structures as you like. But fundamentally, wherever you go, there you are. And uh, it, I have seen people trying different relationship structures. And it's, as you say, an interesting, useful exploration of learning about who they are and what they want and come to terms with that and so on. But it, it can also be a kicking of the can down the road. So it's really unconventional relationship structures seem to be similar to conventional ones in that sense, that you can get into them for different reasons. And the reasons you get into them uh, have an effect on their outcome. And in fact, 
The healthy marriages I've seen, to your point of getting it all from one person and so on, the healthy marriages I've seen, I think, don't have that assumption that they're going to get it all from their partner. And so I think the idea of getting it all from your partner isn't, isn't a necessarily a monogamous assumption. It seems to be an unsuccessful assumption to carry into monogamy. Uh, but successful monogamous partners I know, um, uh, partnerships that I've, I've observed, don't seem to expect to get it all from their uh, partners. In fact, some of the assumptions they seem to have is that satisfaction isn't necessarily derived externally, fundamentally, from others in general. That there, a thousand partners wouldn't scratch that fundamental itch. And in fact, it seems a reorientation towards giving and generosity, a theme you've often brought up, uh, seems to, in some ways, of course it takes two to tango, it seems in some ways to be more satisfying uh, than getting in a certain sense, or at least an orientation towards giving, mutual giving, uh, in which, of course, an arrangement like that one is getting as well, um, seems to be more sustainable, uh, less scorekeeping um, than looking to be satisfied in every dimension by the partner. And, but then this, I think, reaches a, an interesting question that I wonder what you think about this. As culture has opened up and the assumptions you're saying that previously had people assuming uh, monogamous relationships and so on as cultures op open up uh, different relationship structures become uh, discussed and uh, the cultural forces towards monogamy soften and other forces such as religious forces and so on um, weaken the sorts of external forces that would guide your decision making as those soften and, and weaken one has more freedom on the one hand but the downside or the cost of the price, if you like, of admission to that freedom is responsibility of personal choice. One has to decide then more why be in relationship, for what purpose to be in relationship. Uh, if the usual assumptions are weakened, then one has to find, it seems, one's own reason, uh, which could be in line with the old, old reasons, or maybe it's something else. And that's something I think that seems crucial in uh, for couples, is to really be in accord with why the why of the relationship what's the purpose is it to raise a family for example to build a family if so that's a clear purpose is it to travel the world world together if so that's a purpose is it to engage in uh psychological excavation and healing and so on there are actually relationships built on that premise in fact yeah um, the, the question in those such relationships is always well what happens when you're healed <laughs> and you've got nothing more to do, but you have to find a new purpose. And in fact, the purposes can change uh, in a relationship. That's actually true. So, you know, it seems important to uh, things that people might not perhaps immediately think is what is the why? Um, what are those assumptions that you're going in with? And are, are they clearly understood? And uh, that's important so that the partnership is uh, on the same footing. Also, another thing that seems to be important is, is shared values. So what do you think of this, um, this idea of why? I'm curious, you know, I hear people asking a lot, why should I get into a relationship? And they, they actually don't know why. I ask, sometimes ask people, why do you want a relationship? Or I ask people, why are you in your relationship? And often uh, the answer is not clear. It doesn't mean it's not there. Perhaps it's just unconscious or unexamined. Uh, but sometimes people go, yeah, it's a good question. And they actually don't have a good answer as to why they want to. Uh, what, and I think that could be slightly tr problematic uh, in terms of the success of a relationship. It's a, at that point, I think, a little bit of a, a gamble. As there's more diversity, culturally speaking, as to how we conduct relationships, we can, uh, we, we, we're going to share fewer and fewer assumptions with those that we meet about what, what the relationship is going to be because there's so many more options. So it seems an even more pressing question. So what do you think of this idea of why? Yeah, well, you know, why is a big piece of, um, you know, what I concern myself with when working with couples and a lot of the work that we've done together centers around the why. And the why has layers, right? The, there is the personal why. 
And of course, right, it's fairly commonly assumed nowadays that before you get into a relationship or when you're looking for the one, and we can discuss if there is such a thing as the one, right, separately, but the one as in the one you're entering into relationship with, uh, regardless if you believe that that's the one or one of the ones you're going to be with, doesn't matter. But um, most people nowadays um, have a bit of an inkling, not everyone, but many people have uh, an inkling that they should be uh, clarifying what they want from a partner before they get a partner. Now, not everybody, but so maybe we'll talk about that first, right? There's a whole process um, of uh, determining your values and who you are, and then uh, based on and then determining what do you want in a partner and then seeing how um, who you are lines up with or, or how it aligns or doesn't align with the kind of partner you want. And of course, in an ideal world and in a lot of what we do, um, we help people get skills and insights into how to develop those aspects that then align with a partner. So there's that, right? There's the pre-partnership preparation, so to speak. But of course that doesn't always happen. And also because, you know, people fall in love or, uh, or they're already in a relationship and then in a relationship, the why, meaning the purpose of the relationship um, has to be examined all the time. And um, over the years, I kind of developed a formal process for that, a number of questions uh, that each person answers for themselves. And then a number of questions that they answer as a couple where they determine what is it, right? That is the purpose of the relationship. And then depending on the purpose of the relationship, you align your skill acquisition, um, you know, and you align uh, your uh your joint and individual efforts with that purpose, that would be the ideal set of circumstances. So for instance, right, um, this is an example that I often give because it's it happens quite a bit. You have people um, who met while they were both, um, you know, single and uh, excited about, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur or traveling the world or, you know, being one of those people who is in different global nomad kind of person, right? And it's in, and so there's a specific purpose to their lives, and that is exploration while finding out how to make a mark in the world uh, in some entrepreneurial way. And then they find each other and that's really cool. Now they travel the world together, they do their, you know, their, they do their things individually or together. And it's really exciting. It's this great adventure. And then one of the two of them might go, well, I want a baby or I want to settle that. I want a home. I, I just can't be with this one backpack and my, you know, my selfie stick or whatever. Right. I, I want a home. I want to settle down somewhere. And the other person goes, no, I wouldn't. You know, there's whole continents I haven't seen yet. Then suddenly you're misaligned in the purpose of the relationship. And that can cause some some real massive friction, either actual friction where people start disagreeing or one person forgoes their own wants and needs and yearnings to kind of stay with the other, which also creates all kinds of, you know, um, landmines. Um, and so at that point and periodically through a relationship, either at that point where there's a friction point, or if you really want to be really good about um, cultivating and maintaining relationship, you do it before there's a friction point and you look at how can you realign or can you realign, you get help with the realignment or you get help with the, um, you know, the consequences of not being aligned. I think that's really, really important. And I think at any given moment in a, let's say, long-term relationship, um, there is the need to do that on occasion, like for instance, um, a friend of mine, uh, her her uh, you know her child just left home for college, so that's a moment where the relationship is going to require something totally different, or after people have a baby, or after they 
uh, acquired or sold a company or whatever, right? Or a health scare. That's a big one as well, right? When somebody has a health scare or health issue that needs to be dealt with and their relationship has to change because of that. So I think that it's a useful model for exploration as far as what needs to happen and what um, can be done. Yeah, that's quite interesting. And as you're talking there, I'm thinking of one's wider orientation, one's wider life ethic, uh, for example. And this is quite an existential question, I suppose. What's the meaning of life? You know, what, are, what, are, what is it all about? Uh, it's perhaps kind of high on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But the problem, one of the problems, I think, with the idea of trying to get fundamentally relationship is about what you can get or a partner is about what you can get or what, which of your needs you can meet is that assuming you could get and have your needs met by the shifting target of an ex another human being, but assuming you could, the question still fundamentally remains, now what? Now you've got it. Now you've got it all. This is the ideal. Now you've got the your needs met. Now you're being nourished. Now what is the what are you going to do now? Just <laughs> be nourished. Is that what life's all about? Having your needs met until you die. Perhaps I'm getting a little existential here. But if we think of memento mori, when one's on one's deathbeds and one looks back and says something like, you know, we're reflecting on your life and you say, well, I got my needs met. You know, I just don't know if that's going to be enough. No. At that point, you know, I think of Viktor Frankl, that great book, Man's Search for Meaning, for example, uh, which which deals with these questions. Most people, it seems, uh, find greater satisfaction, not in only securing them that the, the, there, there are needs. Of course, if you're in a survival situation, then, of course, your needs are the primary thing. So orienting your life to meeting your basic needs uh, when it's necessary is, of course, natural. But after a certain point, assuming you can get past that, it seems most people derive a greater satisfaction in giving, an ethic of giving, or an orientation of contribution. Uh, sometimes it's called service, for example, uh, being part of something uh, that's not more than just about meeting your own needs, right? Whether it's being part of a family, whether it's being part of uh, you know, uh, a society, or uh, some sort of uh, mission. Some people find that in religious or political movements or whatever's the case. I think questions about why do you want to be in relationship? And when you know, you're asking a couple, perhaps, what's the relationship about? And you're attempting to, in a certain sense, create very often a shared vision, create a shared vision, because it's not always assumed. It's not always handed down. Sometimes it does need to be created. And that can be quite an actually an exciting uh, um, and a generative process. It doesn't have to be a kind of uh, oh, we're going to discover we want different things. Well, that's not necessarily a problem because from those different desires and different uh, aims, something quite creative, uh, that a third thing can be uh, generated that you can be, both be a part of. I think that, that actually can be very positive. It's not necessarily a death sentence when you discover, oh, we want slightly different things. Well, it's not so bad necessarily. Yeah. But, but it seems that, that uh, eventually um, it's, it goes even further into questions of, well, what do you want to do? With, you know, with your life, what are you, what are, what are you about? What are your core values as a person within which the values of the relationship are nested? And um, I think this is an interesting uh, <laughs> point, an interesting thought, because you know it speaks to I think the um, it speaks to the difficulty that people seem to have statistically anyway of maintaining satisfying, um, meaningful uh, relationships. Statistically, we think of divorce, the divorce rates. Yeah, of course, people are having difficulty, it seems, uh, making it work. And no wonder um, when, in a certain sense, the entire thing rests very much on what's the point of the relationship? And then what's the point of life? What's the point of my life? What, what, what am I part of here? Uh, with the greater freedoms we have increasingly culturally, um, I think the burden of deciding that falls more and more on the individual to generate. Yeah, well, you're making many excellent points here. <laughs> um, and I think this is a huge discussion, right? I mean, we were just starting this kind of 
uh, conversation series. And I think each of those points actually warrants a whole conversation in itself because there's so much in there. But I think a few things I want to pick up on is, of course, that um, we started talking about relationship, right? And so within relationship, there is a few things to consider. And within uh, each individual, there's a few learning steps that have to be considered. And one of the big learning steps that we all have to uh, engage in individually is the basic um, caring for oneself, right? Being able to provide oneself with the basics. And that's not just food, shelter, clothing, right? But also uh, things like the abilities to set boundaries, uh, the ability to not harm ourselves, feed ourselves properly, take care of our bodies, you know, from self-care uh, on the basic level. And so um, one would hope that we all acquire that in our youth, but we don't always for a, a number of reasons. And so, you know, I think being able to maintain uh, an, a kind of a, an individual center is very important to the entering into relationship, of course. So I think it's important to understand that there is a one aspect of what can I get out of the relationship on the fundamental self-development aspect. I don't think that can be bypassed. You need to be able to ask for what you need and you need to be able to state your boundaries properly. At which point that becomes not the purpose of the relationship or that becomes, that's not the driving force in the relationship. Once that's been handled and there's enough communication and relationship, then it does absolutely and ultimately become about uh, generosity and contribution and service um, within the relationship and then in the wider context. And they kind of are layers and none of those layers can be bypassed. When people bypass those layers, um, they become martyrs or they become somewhat spiritually or religiously uh, you know, obsessed with the service aspect without taking care of their personal needs. Um, and things like that. So I think there's stages of development, like some very basic psychological evolutionary stages of development. But once they have been dealt with, and by the way, you said something very, very important. Of course, if you're in an emergency situation, right, and uh, food, shelter, and basic safety are threatened, all the other stuff goes kind of out of the window because you have to just stay alive. But once you're past that point, then often in successful relationships and in successful humans in general, there comes that moment of wanting to give of oneself, wanting to give, of, like you said, for, this, for the sake of service or the benefit of others, um, for a greater good, might it be uh, societal, political, religious, spiritual, uh, philanthropic in whatever sense, right? I think that's, that, that is, as we know, right? We talk about this all the time. There's studies out there that generosity is the number one marker of successful long-term relationship. And generosity isn't um, giving expensive gifts. It's that extra cup of tea, that moment before you snap at somebody, the giving somebody the benefit of the doubt, the having the conversation when you really don't feel like it, but you know it's the thing that helps the other person, you know, like all of those kind of things. But if it's a bypass, it's, it's going to ruin you or the relationship. Yeah, that's, I think that's very interesting. It's a disposition, you're saying, really. But for, in order for it to function successfully or properly or well, then ideally um, there, there, are other, there, are, there are prerequisites to that. The question I think that came to my mind was, well, how can one have that disposition of generosity or giving without being uh, exploited, for example, taken advantage of, or without indeed becoming a martyr oneself? Uh, or doing it in some sort of a, a shadowy, uh, underhanded way. And you, I think you've answered that there, that there are certain prerequisites that can't be skipped or certain things that at least need to be um, in development, uh, such as individuation of 
your own boundaries and recognizing your own needs and so on and so forth. So I think that's very interesting. Uh, we've talked, I think, uh, about why, and we've delved into these questions. And, you know, really, uh, how necessary is it for an individual to, to go this deep? Uh, I'm not sure, actually, I'm not sure. But we've done that today. And it's interesting to do that. You know, I think in our future conversations, as we talk more, we'll, we, we'll, we'll move past this and we'll say, okay, we, we've talked about the why. Now let's just assume you're in the relationship, let's say, or let's, you know, let, let's, let's move beyond having dealt with the why. And I'm curious to ask you about, you know, the different sorts of challenges that occur in relationships and um, uh, way, ways to resolve those. Also, unexplored or uh, cool ideas for ways to enrich an already functioning relationship, perhaps. I mean, that's something that's often uh, missed, I think, ways in which couples can enrich their relationships. I'd be curious about some of your your thoughts on that. Uh, and indeed, uh, many other things, uh, communication skills, boundary skills, how to argue effectively and so on. I'd like to actually uh, cover all those sorts of topics. And in fact, people can who are listening or watching, if you have topics and ideas you'd like to be discussed, then let us know in the comments or you can write to us at workshops at michaelabum.com and we can, uh, uh, we can put them in the pot for future conversations. Well, Michaela, I think this has been so interesting. It's so fascinating. Thank you very much. I look forward to the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Michaela Bohm podcast. For workshops, courses, teacher trainings and more, visit www.michaelabohm.com.